Hey folks, here I am on a train and I'm approaching Waterloo, um, Waterloo Battlefield. So as anybody who follows the um, Facebook page or indeed my channel um, of recent days will know I'm spending a day in Belgium at the Battle of Waterloo um, battlefield um, with a bunch of archaeologists and other people who are working on the Waterloo Uncovered project. Um, and so that's what I'm, I'm here to do some filming. I'm also here to uh, do some bayonet training and um, teach some bayonet of the Napoleonic era and a little bit after as well as a bit of a contrast. So um, here we go. Um, it's exciting stuff and uh, thank you very much to the Waterloo Uncovered team for inviting me here. And uh, I've never actually stayed in Belgium, I don't think, before, although I'm not really staying here. I'm only here for one day, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it's a nice countryside to look at and uh, I'll be back with you in a minute with some more film footage. Cheers. Hey, so here I am at Hougamont Farm. I apologise for the wind, there's nothing I can do about that. So Hougamont played an absolutely pivotal role um, during the Battle of Waterloo. Obviously, um, Napoleon's Grand Armée tried to catch, capture it. It was defended ferociously um, by the defenders. Um, including the Coldstream Guards, um, some of whom are some current Coldstream Guards and ex-Coldstream Guards, obviously not from the time of Napoleon, are here working on the, um, on the archaeological site and the examination of this site. And um, it played an absolutely pivotal role because it was, it was a, essentially a strong point, a strong holding point, and it was important for Napoleon to capture this um, uh, in, order, in order for him to control the battlefield in this particular area. The, I, can't, uh, I can't express how huge the battlefield of Waterloo is and was. Um, it covered a vast, vast area and um, Hougamont Farm is a very, very small part of that. But because of where it lies in the land, Wellington realised early on that it was very important to keep it and hold it. Um, and they did, the British Army did, um, with allies involved as well. Um, and uh, it's amazing to see this. I've seen Hougamont Farm featured in, um, in TV and film and even computer games. Uh, anyone who plays Napoleonic Wars, um, as many of my viewers will know I do, will recognise this. This is one of the maps that you play on the Mini Siege server, for example. It's used, in, in fact, on many of the servers. And it's amazing to see the thing in real life. Um, I'm going to have a look around the farm um, and I'll maybe do a little bit of talking as I go around. This is the south gate. This is the south gate. I always say it's the north gate, make a total twat to all your viewers. <laughs> so behind me we've got the south gate, um, which was assaulted ferociously by French forces. Um, and, uh, and it was held, the gate itself um, was attacked, I believe, with axes. Um, and um, the whole front of this building would have been under fire from musketry and perhaps um, light artillery at some point. Um, obviously you've got two windows there and up there you've got a high window and further windows over there. So um, there would have been a ferocious defence of this. There may indeed have been uh, people up on the roof shooting down as well. And you can see that we've got this perimeter wall which actually goes right the way around um, Hougamont Farm. <coughs> um, and presumably, well, there's some. So I'll talk a little bit about this wall for a second, okay? It's just a wall. You'd think it's not very interesting, but it's really interesting. Why is it so interesting? Well, first of all, it was obviously very important to the defence of Hougamont. Um, but what you see here as the wall now is not the wall. It transpires. It's not the original wall that was there. It seems to have been rebuilt. Um, and it seems that not even the light stones at the bottom are original, as far as I've gathered so far. The whole thing seems to have been rebuilt. Probably the stone, um, the bricks and the stone were robbed away by local farmers for walls and buildings. Perhaps by souvenir hunters, an interesting feature of this site is that it attracted um, tourists, uh, some of the earliest battlefield tourists, um, not that long after the Battle of uh, Waterloo, actually started travelling here, particularly from Britain of course, um, to visit the site and presumably some of them took souvenirs home. Um, so this wall is Shall we say it might be partially original, but it's not that original. We don't know really how tall it would have been originally, but we also don't know. It may have been loopholed. 
um, that is have holes put through it for shooting through or it may not again we're not entirely sure there's I believe there's conflicting evidence and um, we don't know how people would have shot over it if they would have uh, made a firing step um, some kind of um, you know put planks and barrels and whatever the other side to stand on we don't really know but almost certainly they did defend this wall somehow obviously otherwise um, the attacking forces could just climb over it so they must have defended it presumably with musket fire but also I would presume with bayonet point as well um, given that if they're attacking if the attacking forces are attacking that gate then they're right the way along this wall so um, I would suggest that to prevent people from just scaling over that wall there must have been people being active with their bayonets should we say that would be my interpretation and I don't see if you didn't defend that with bayonets and potentially swords for officers and pistols if you didn't defend it with those weapons I don't think that musketry alone would prevent people from just scaling that wall uh, with ladders or whatever they had just standing on on your mates shoulders basically um, and then you've got this extra building to the side here. I've seen some interpretations of these having firing slots put in them, um, but I can't see any evidence of that there now, so I don't know what the evidence of that is. But one thing I should say is that these are quite big buildings. They're quite tall and substantial. Um, and you know, it's not gonna, if you haven't got really long ladders, it's not gonna be easy to get over those buildings at all. Uh, and it would seem like the weak point is this perimeter wall which runs right, right the way around the farm but having said that that wall must have been well manned and well defended we don't know how tall it was um, and additionally even if you got into that perimeter wall you're not into the inner enclosure yet of the actual farm itself anyway so this is the south gate an incredibly important part of Hougamont farm so what we're going to do now is we're going to walk around the edge of the farm we've got the south gate just behind me there and as you can see hopefully relative to me these are really big buildings really tall buildings um, if you do play uh, napoleonic wars online incidentally these buildings are bigger than they are in that game, definitely, they're taller. Um, and so we've got a, another roof going along up here, a large wall. I don't know how original that wall is. Remember this entire farm complex was under really, you know, assault for hours. So it would have been mullered. And we know from photographs from the 19th century that it was like really battered and broken apart. And a lot of what you see here now is reconstructed. Um, we've currently got a gate in the side. I'm not, I'm not sure how, um, how, uh, how long that's been there. Um, and then we've got older looking walls as we come along the side. What I'm coming around to is one of the other really important gates, which is at the other side. Um, and we know that this was assaulted as well. One thing I should mention incidentally, the south gate, which is back up behind me up there, beyond there we know would have been all woods. Um, we know that the French army advanced uh, through the woods and that of course would have provided them with quite a lot of protection against musketry. As far as we know, there wasn't any artillery or, you know, um, small field pieces. There weren't any in Hougamont itself. So the only thing that the defenders have got to hurl at the attacking French forces are muskets and rifles at this point, and debatably pistols at very close range. Um, so they don't have an awful lot to shoot um, at the attacking forces. And of course, shooting into woods, a lot of your musket balls are just going to be lost into the trees, essentially, into the, into the trunks. And my understanding actually is there's various points around this battlefield where the trunks of the trees, which are still trees that were there at the time of the Battle of Waterloo, have yielded up some musket balls, amazingly. Now this is very clearly a modern reconstructed gate, but it is a replacement for the original gate which was attacked, assaulted, with axes. Um, if you watch uh, the Sharp series, I believe this is the gate um, uh, that essentially was defended by the Coldstream Guards and Richard Sharp, of course, <laughs> who I think is a colonel by that point. Um, and these gates got smashed down, um, uh, chopped up, um, by axes and other things and um, but then they were kind of like they essentially blocked the breach and held it so this was very very uh, toughly assaulted and this is completely the opposite side I guess this is the north side the north gate completely the other side to the to the south gate 
um, and uh, the lay of the land is quite interesting if you just look behind me you can see that there are um, sort of rolling low hills um, and it does mean that for a certain distance you can approach this farm without being able to be shot at because you're behind the lay of the land but then if anybody was approaching from this direction they would have to come down and then back up again and they would be very exposed to musketry in that area although uh, my understanding is that's not currently thought to be the area of the heaviest um, shooting that was actually at the other side of the farm which we'll go and look at in a bit but anyway this gate and obviously reconstructed and the whole thing's reconstructed because it was all broken down but this this the placement for this gate is incredibly important to essentially the siege as it were of Hougamont farm Bayonets have certainly been used offensively in Iraq and in Afghanistan. I know people who have used bayonets to, to, to uh, kill enemy, in this case Taliban soldiers uh, or, or fighters. Um, and it's usually because you end up in such a confused situation you trip over something using it. Um, what we're not taught to do is to fight with bayonets. Um, we're taught to kill with bayonets, but we're not taught actually to engage in a fencing match with them. Um, and it would be pretty ineffective because our rifles are that long. The bayonet is your last resort that you have in case your rifle fails. Or if you find yourself in a position where you are toe to toe with somebody, you have no ammunition left or you haven't got time to change magazines or whatever, it's an emergency last resort. It's also a useful tool. It, 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 does, it has various weird functions like as a wire cutter and that sort of thing. Um, but it's more than anything else, it's a psychological tool. I have seen people in my battalion fix bayonets in a bazaar in Basra when the locals were kicking up a bit um, and they didn't want to, you know, firing warning shots is fairly irresponsible in a built up area, they didn't have any other means of, uh, of escalating so they fixed bayonets and funnily enough everybody got very friendly very quickly because bayonets are extremely intimidating, nobody wants to be stabbed. When we, when we carry out ceremonial duties soldiers always have bayonets fixed because again, it's part of the panoply of war that you roll out with a ceremonial, ceremonial roll. So, so, so bayonets are a symbol, um, but they're also a psychological tool. But they are also still a weapon. But what they're not are something that you plan your battle around. And I think that is where we have fundamentally shifted. And that, I think, is what I'm going to ask Matt. So literally speaking, what a bayonet is, is the pointy bit that you attach to the end of your firearm. Um, it can take many forms, it can be a spike, it can be uh, a knife, it can even be a sword. Um, this is a slight tangent, but um, believe it or not, the, the Royal Marines and Royal Navy actually had cutlasses that you could fit to the end of uh, a shortened rifle, a two-band rifle, um, which has got a blade about that long. And that was to make up for the fact that their firearm was shorter, so they wanted a longer bayonet. And that's how seriously they took bayonet. What it originated from, if you go all the way back, is from the pike. So in the 17th century, um, you have people shooting muskets, and then you have people holding pikes, which are really long spears. And the pikeman's main job is to protect the musketeers. So you've got these two arms working together. And who are they protecting the musketeers from? They're protecting them from cavalry. Because firearms, at this point, you have to fight off, pull your powder down, put your wadding down, put your ball down, get your ramrod out, load it. It's a very slow process. You can only shoot about, say, between, depending on the quality of the soldiers, between two and four rounds a minute. Someone who's really, really good can maybe get even above four rounds a minute, but very unlikely. That's really slow. If you're shooting at opponents who are only 80 yards away or 60 yards away, then in the time it takes to reload, they can just run at you and hit you, okay? 
So it's really important that you have something to protect you while you're reloading. And in the 17th century, that was pikemen. But in the late 17th century, someone had a bright idea. They thought, well, we've got pikemen and we've got musketeers. Why don't we try and combine them into one troop type? And so they gave them something called the plug bayonet, which is essentially a dagger with a tapered handle. And if you shoot at someone and then you see them running at you and you think, hmm, I haven't got time to reload, you pull out your plug bayonet and you jam it into the barrel of your musket. And now you've got a spear and you can fight and defend yourself. It's a Waterloo example over at Pont Noir, where the young guard are deployed, I think the young guard Pont Noir, to attack the Prussians who are coming in and they very deliberately uh, ensure that their muskets are unloaded before mm. they go into the attack because they've decided to carry the attack with the bayonet and what they find, find particularly with young troops is if, if they because you tend to stop the advance to fire so you bring them in, halt, present and fire and they found that once you've stopped the troops it was very difficult to get them moving again so by ensuring that everybody has their muskets unloaded they know it's a bayonet charge and there is no requirement for anybody to stop, present and fire because they're going in with cold steel and, and, in fact, and it's a really important... Yeah and in fact this we see this repeated throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century so a famous example from the 19th century is the Battle of Tel Kabir in 1882 um, where the uh, Highlanders were told, the Highland Regiment I think it was the 72nd, were told to not load um, and to only go in with cold steel with bayonets and swords, <coughs> uh, swords for the officers, bayonets for the men and um, essentially because the Egyptian trenches were um, were filled with the Egyptian troops who had, they were dug in and you couldn't physically really shoot it. that hay bale over there. So turn and face, we'll take it that you've fixed bayonets um, and obviously closing with and attacking the enemy has to be accompanied by an aggressive cast of face, show them your war face. <laughs> um, um, noise, aggression and fury. So, stand to attention, high port, a standing thrust at a lying enemy, advance! Ah! Ah! High port, check the bayonet. There we go, finish. Right, that, that's uh, in a, uh, perfect, perfect, perfect. there we go. So what you saw there, round of applause. What you see there is an example of speed, aggression, fury, and stabbing a hay bale. Um, and ability. Sorry? That's really the extent of the techniques we're taught. It is not a fighting technique, it is simply a means of killing what is in front of you. And what Matt is going to talk about now um, is about the time when it was actually quite a sophisticated fighting technique and entire mechanisms of training were designed around how to teach people to contest a fight with a bayonet and survive the experience. Matt. Yeah, so for a start, I mean, obviously the context has <laughs> entirely changed. Um, these days, if you're using a bayonet, it's very unlikely that your opponent is also going to have a bayonet. Also, even if they do, the length of modern rifles uh, are, is very short. Um, and so some of the things that were done with a long weapon, you can't really do with a short weapon. Um, but it's interesting that in the British Army, at least, it's kind of got full circle. In the, in, in the 18th century, so you know, you think about the Battle of Culloden, for example, where the, the, the government army was famously using bayonets against the, the charging Highlanders with their swords and targes. Um, but as far as we know, their training was practically nothing. They were, they were given a, a musket, they were given a bayonet, and they were told basically you use it like this, and that was it. Which is funny because it's kind of more similar to the modern bayonet training from my perspective. But in the middle, between the 18th century and the 20th century, there was a sort of renaissance of, of martial arts in Europe, um, where they developed sophisticated systems for the use of all weapons. Um, and the bayonet came under attention for that. Now, interestingly, you think the Napoleonic period, this surely would be, because this is the period when uh, military swordsmanship gained lots of uh, interest and attention from the government and everybody else. Um, but strangely enough, both in Britain and France, there was no regulation bayonet system until well after the Napoleonic Wars. 
Um, in Britain, it wasn't until 1829 that a guy called Henry Angelo, who was a fencing instructor, devised and started teaching a system as regulation to British troops. And it wasn't until 1827 in France, where a guy called Muller um, did the same thing in, in France. So it was this kind of 1820s period, ironically, you know, a period of peace. Funnily enough, we can actually see, it's funny that these are Japanese because there's a parallel with Japanese martial arts. We notice that a lot of the Japanese martial arts that survive today are from periods of peace. Um, a lot of the weapons and martial arts of war um, haven't really survived to the modern age. Um, a lot of what has survived are from periods of peace where people thought, oh, we really like playing with swords or we really like playing with spears or bayonets. Let's develop a really complex system and write it down in books. Won't that be great fun? And we'll have a school. And, and so they had the time and the leeway to do this. Whereas during the Napoleonic Wars, it was about churning out soldiers and getting them out to the field as quickly as possible. So they didn't necessarily have that much time to think about the training systems of the soldiers. So it's often in periods of peace that we see the greatest preparation for war, ironically. Um, but there was one person who stood out from that trend. In 1805, his name was Anthony Gordon, and he was already described as an invalid and a retired major. Um, and when he was a captain um, in the 67th uh, of Regiment of Foot, I believe, um, he started devising a system for the use of bayonets. And he was the first person that we know of, in a, at least in an advanced way, to do this in the British Army. And he had some friends in high places, such that by 1805, he, when he was quite old, um, he published a book on it. Now, as far as we know, this never became regulation. It wasn't widely adopted. And as a system, it's a little bit strange. Uh, but we're going to look at some quirks from it today because it helps illustrate what normal bayonet fighting was like compared to what he was trying to do. He kind of shows ways of countering the normal stuff. Um, but um, we're also going to look just a little uh, at some basics. Now, the first thing to say, I'm just bring Charlie over here. If you just hold the bayonet towards me like you're going to stab me. Ah! Right, okay. So, first things to mention are, if you just come a bit this way. There we go. First thing to say is, let's look at what we've got here. We've got a person, they've got two hands on the weapon. You notice that he's holding it in the same position that he would fire the weapon in. So the right hand, assuming he's right-handed, and probably most soldiers would be forced to be right-handed at this date, even if they weren't. Um, the right hand's on the, the pistol part of the grip there, and the left hand is supporting the weapon close to the point of balance. That leaves a lot of weapon in front of the hand, but it also leaves a little bit behind as well. Now, clearly this is the good way to shoot a rifle, but it's also got some advantages for using in close combat, because now you've got the length of weapon in front of your lead hand that's actually longer than a lot of sword blades. This is important because if you're fighting against cavalry or an officer who's attacking you with his sword, it means you can outreach the sword with your bayonet, okay? Without them being able to hit you in the hand or any part of your body. The fact that you've got some, what, what's known as the butt um, sticking out the back is also useful because if for some reason the front of the weapon gets knocked or pushed aside or simply you're attacked at a moment whereby you can't get the front of the weapon to bear because the person's too close, you have the butt to strike with, which is also really, really important. Now, Charlie mentioned something. He mentioned uh, striking with a weapon like this. Believe it or not, this is incredibly important in the 18th century. And again, coming back to the Americans, the Americans didn't like using bayonets and were famous for clubbing their muskets. So if we look at the um, War of Independence or the, uh, the sort of so-called Indian Wars, um, muskets were very frequent if you watch like Last of the Mohicans or something like that, it's actually quite accurate. They very often used um, muskets and rifles to hit with the stock. It's a, it's a big stick, why not hit someone with a big stick if you need to hit them? It's a shame um, that Tony's walked away because he found archaeological evidence for that at Culloden and we found similar here yeah. in the, in the uh, pieces of the uh, tail of the um, trigger guard. Uh, it's here that the musket will snap yeah. if you use it hard enough and you yeah. can find those, we found those pieces in the uh, killing zone. Yeah. And it, interestingly that this was done in the Americas actually because the um, Native Americans actually have a form of um, war club which is shaped, it's called a gunstock club um, and it's specifically shaped like a gunstock because it was so popular to hit with that end of the, end of the weapon. Um, and we know also that many people who actually had bayonets on the end of their weapon 
did in the heat of the moment and panic and stress and everything else go ah and just hit with the thing instead <laughs> instead of poking and um, <laughs> and in fact I know one account again from the Indian Mutiny which is the, one of the main things I study where someone famously did this and struck like this but they actually stabbed themselves with their own bayonet in doing it so there are some hazards there are some hazards to doing that I, I can add a couple of modern examples I know, I know um, of a chap from the Irish Guards who did exactly that in Basra, not stabbed himself, but used his rifle as a club um, when he found himself in a close call fight and didn't have his bayonet fixed, schoolboy, um, didn't have his bayonet fixed and turned his, his uh, little metal SA-80 round and used that We've as a club. introduced the concept of, of strong and weak and so a lot of bayonet fighting um, is about, because of course, again, the, the, my favourite word, context, the context is completely different in the 19th century the most likely opponent you're going to come up against is going to have exactly the same kind of weapon as you. That means to stab them, you have got to not be stabbed by this. And that's actually really, really hard. It would be the easiest thing in the world for me to just go, ah, and stab, and we just stab each other. And that's not going to, you know, if, if all the soldiers do that, the battle's going to be over quickly and no one's going to be the winner. Um, so you don't want that. So you have to give them some way of stabbing the opponent without being stabbed. So one way is, I showed, to get the strong of your blades to the weak of their blade yeah. and run through. Now notice I tilted the angle out then. It's a sensitive thing. If I start to come up here and Charlie starts to raise his hands, I have to raise my hands. And they might get a point at which I can no longer get under there. Yeah, exactly. So I'm the trying game. to get the strong to the weak. He exactly did what he should do there. He took my weak with his strong. But because I've lost the line, he's got the line straight to my chest. I've got to do something quickly, and as I just showed there, I've either got to cover that line like that, or quickly come around back over onto the top of his back. Now in terms of using um, the butt, you can either use it, so the butt very clearly has a much shorter range than the pointy end of the weapon. So the two reasons I might use the butt are either because he's closed on me or I've closed on him. It might be a matter of choice or it might be a matter of circumstance. Um, it, it could just be that, for example, he thrusts at me and I, I defend like this um, and we suddenly will find we're really, really close and the easiest thing for me to do at that point is to smack him in the face with butt. And you notice the beauty of that is it keeps me completely covered from his weapon the whole time. And the butt doesn't only have to be applied to the person's head. Very often it will have the most effect on someone's head. However, um, there are also uh, mentions of the butt being applied into there and um, if, if we're on the other side here, if we've come here, then applying the butt to there. Okay? So you can apply the butt anywhere that it will hurt. But remember, <laughs> except sometimes for the head, the butt isn't usually going to put someone out of action unless you're repeatedly hitting them in the head with it. Um, but for example, if I've come here and I smack him in the head, that might then enable me to come back and stab him with the pointy end of my weapon. Um, which is what will kill him. Oh, we need to put him because I want to get strong to weak, and we're always going to be neutral if we're both symmetrical like this, if we're mirroring each other. So instead, he turns the hand around to this side. The advantage that that's got is in this direction I'm strong, but in that direction he's relatively speaking weak. Okay, and therefore what he aims to do from here, there's also something to do with the legs, but I'll mention that in a minute. What he aims to do from here is get extra reach and also get the strong to the weak here so that I could outreach and out leverage the opponent. Okay? And it's more or less as simple as that. There's, there's two other aspects of his system which are interesting. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon, or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.